Okay, so hello everybody. I have um, the pleasure of hosting this last panel, which is dedicated to the theme of utopias, dystopias and reinventions. Um, the first uh, person we're going to listen to is Jan Shukur, um, who is a PhD student at the Graduate School uh, Practices of Literature at the University of Monster in Germany, uh, where he also works as a research assistant and lecturer for the Chair of English Postcolonial uh, Media Studies. His PhD dissertation is about the critique of neoliberal ideology, intellected Marxist and anarchist utopian texts. So you have uh, 20 minutes, floor's yours. Perfect. Is the voice here? Okay. Hello everyone. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. And also of course, thank you all for listening to me. Uh, this is my first time participating in an international conference, so please bear with me while I try to find my footing. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about how utopia, both as a political method and a literary form, provide us with the possibility of making a critical comment on the antagonistic relationship between scarcity and abundance, using Cory Doctorow's novel Walk Away, you can see here, as a primary example. Throughout the presentation, I will first introduce the theoretical foundation of my paper by talking about utopia and what I mean by it. And then I will establish the setting of the novel and talk about where scarcity and abundance fit within the context. And finally, I will conclude it by bringing the pre previous points together and highlighting my main argument. By the way, is there anybody here who has read the book? Okay. I will do my best to keep the presentation spoiler free, so if it goes well and you guys are interested in the book, it will not be instantly murdered by what I say. But yeah, let me first begin by explaining what I mean when I talk about utopia. Contrary to the what is now default understanding of utopia, in my research it doesn't mean perfection that is impossible to reach at a place that doesn't exist. In the mouths of the apostles who spread the word of the lack of alternatives and who proselytize the end of history, utopia is not only unrealistic and pointless, but it is also dangerous. Constructing a utopian blueprint and attempting to drive society towards a pre-designed perfect future can only lead to bloodshed and totalitarianism in the eyes of thinkers such as Karl Popper. While it is an understandable tendency at the moment to equate utopia with impossibility and unreality, I would argue that it is also a too easy one that hinders our ability to see the clusters of possibilities that a utopian premise would contain. So, if we have established what a utopia is not, what is to be understood from it then? Here it is best to mention Frederick Jameson as one of the pioneers who dared to rescue the term of utopia and utopianism even during the Cold War. Quoting from him, it is practical thinking which everywhere represents a capitulation to the system itself and stands as a testimony to the power of that system to transform even its adversaries into its own mirror image. The utopian idea, on the contrary, keeps alive the possibility of a world qualitatively distinct from this one and takes the form of a stubborn negation of all that is. Thus, it's possible to summarize my understanding of utopia, at least concerning this specific conversation, as a stubborn insistence on the existence of alternatives against the imposition of the current socio-political conditions under which we live. I argue that in a society where even the mere suggestion of adapting a different model that's fundamentally divergent from the status quo, where it's immediately dismissed as utopian, with the negative implications that I just recently mentioned, insisting on utopia is a radical political stance and building utopia is a conscientious political method. In addition to utopia as a political method, utopian literature is one of the strongest ways of thinking and narrating alternative futures and socio-economic configurations that go against the grain. 
Concurrent to the recent embracement of utopianism by several political movements, such as the Altermondialisation movement, utopian literature has also expanded upon its initial foundations and developed further related subgenres, critical utopia being the most relevant one to this subject. Tom Moylan has developed this concept by defining it as rejecting utopia as a blueprint while preserving it as a dream. And Walk Away is a critical utopia par excellence, one that thrives in the multitudes of utopian potentialities that it contains, as well as the conflicts that occur uh, between them. Let's now continue by establishing the setting of the novel. Walk Away is set in the near future, sometime in the mid to second half of the 21st century. However, the exact timing is never explicitly stated, since the novel does not wish to appear as a distant futuristic thought experiment, but instead more as a warning of what might imminently become of our current society if no fundamental changes are made, and also what can be done to bring these changes to life. In this bleak and near future, the inherent contradictions of the social economic system, such as wealth inequality and ecological disasters, have accelerated up to a point where society is divided into two classes, with virtually no possibility to move up the social ladder. Technological advances, combined with the disastrous social and environmental conditions, have allowed the mega-rich, called Zotas in the book, to establish a surveillance society for the rest of the popular classes, where employment is so scarce that the masses are forced to continue their lives in a permanent form of gig economy, while the healthy cla uh, sorry, wealthy class, but also the healthy class, has set up separate communities with an overabundance of uh, material goods and wealth. If this sounds familiar to you now in 2022, that's neither a surprise nor a coincidence, as we are also currently surrounded by ideological mystifications that glorify our precarious socioeconomic situations. I would like to think that most of us here as early career stage researchers could relate. Nevertheless, the same technological advances that set the dystopian tone for the daily lives of the masses have also provided them with the material conditions to reject this way of living. The possibility of 3D printing the basic necessities of life, as well as the widespread ability to hack and rework the remnants of the old world, allows those who wish to leave the world of artificial scarcity behind by simply walking away and founding their int intentional post-scarcity communities outside of the default world. They are able to walk away since the vast majority of the population has gathered in metropoles in search for work the novel's example being Toronto, leaving large portions of the land unoccupied. Additionally, the Zotas don't consider those who walk away a real threat because their existence and their ability to walk away prevents a rebellion from rising within their own society. And this is the main dichotomy that drives the plot of the novel forward. The walkaways who have created a network of decentralized communities, practicing a variety of socioeconomic systems which help them transcend scarcity, versus the world of default they left behind, where the contradictions of capitalism have reached a boiling point, essentially transforming the ongoing mode of governance to techno-feudalism. The three protagonists that we encounter immediately in the opening chapter, aptly titled Communist Party, take us readers through the challenges of walking away from default and adapting to a utopia in the making, one that must face the aggression of the world they are trying to leave behind, as well as the struggles of creating non-hierarchical and decentralized communities. I mentioned a minute ago that it's the practice of different socioeconomic systems that help the walkaways transcend scarcity. And I should explain it a little further. Let's take a moment and think back to the founding myth of classical, which is to say capitalist economic, economics. The resources are scarce, but the wants are infinite. Les besoins sont illimités, les ressources sont rares. This was the first thing in French that I was taught in my introduction to the economics class back in undergraduate, sometime a little after the Bronze Age. The underlying assumption behind this ideological construct is that humans will always be full of unlimited needs, needs that are determined by the socioeconomic system under which they live, and there will never be enough material abundance to satisfy everyone's unlimited needs. This construct has been used as a justification for structural inequality for a really long time in real life, and it also forms the basis of default in the novel. Yet technolo technology in the book has finally provided them with the material conditions to produce whichever good that's necessary to satisfy whichever human need. 
The issue then becomes this. What type of socioeconomic system would determine a different need for humans, or organize these materials and goods so that we can all live in abundance? The author, Cory Doctorow, approaches this question in an atypical manner for utopian literature. In the network of walkaway communities, there is no specific mode of governance to which people must adhere. The character Limpopo, which serves as an introductory guiding figure for both the protagonists and the reader to the world of walkaway, sums the situation up by simply saying, there are as many walkaway philosophies as there are walkaways. The main feature that they have in common is that none of these philosophies or governance strategies are based on market economy patterns. Dr. Romani discusses two alternative configurations, reputation economy and gift economy, arguing that they could provide a better and more sustainable form of efficiency, unlike the market economy. Reputation economy is organized through the tenet of everyone gets out what they put in, which creates a different form of hierarchization. According to Kirsten Fitzpatrick's detailed history of the concept, it first evolved in online spaces of peer-to-peer -peer networks, such as blogs or forums, where the feedback mechanism is given to all members of the community. As a result, the peers who have the most positive feedback, those who were deemed to put in the best quality or the hardest amount of work, are awarded a higher degree of reputation and authority. And although it doesn't operate with the same mechanisms as a capitalist market economy, it still functions in a similar way concerning the question of scarcity. By assigning a certain value to a person's reputation, one automatically agrees that they only deserve to be compensated according to their abilities regarding issues and questions that are useful. Kirsten Bussier sums it up by paraphrasing Dr. Reputation, like money, only works if there is not enough to go around. She also considers this model in the book to be a twisted version of utopia, a challenge that the initial builders of utopia are forced to face as they bring remnants of the system which they have been a part of for so many years before walking away. It is possible to think of rep reputation economy as a representation of the utopian blueprint that Moylan's critical utopia explicitly rejects. As I previously mentioned, Dr. O is not shy in exploring the limits of utopia while stressing the potentialities that it contains. And the gift economy is the alternative with which it, he sides very clearly. What's important to note, and relevant to the topic at hand, is that this utopian reconfiguration is possible only with the condition of abundance. Quoting from Bussier again, the point of the walkaway gift economy is to live in a state of abundance which means that people do not need to worry if they're putting in as much as they take out, because there is always enough for everyone. These two alternative models come into conflict when Limpopo's comprehensive walkaway habitat belt embraces is forcibly taken over by reputation economy zealots. And instead of fighting back and escalating the conflict, Limpopo simply walks away and establishes a new BMB somewhere else with her fellows. This does not mean that Limpopo is always portrayed as a saintly figure, as the utopian messiah that can do no wrong and sees no temptations anywhere. On the contrary, Doctoro as a critical utopian lays her inner contradictions bare in the following quote. She had more comets into the Belt and Braces firmware than anyone, an order of magnitude lead over the rest. In a gift economy, you gave without keeping score, because keeping score implied an expectation of reward. If you're doing something for reward, it's an investment, not a gift. In theory, Limpopo agreed. In practice, it was so easy to keep score. The leaderboard was so satisfying that she couldn't help herself. She wasn't proud of this." End quote. However, the fact that Limpopo is such a staunch proponent of the gift economy, even though she would be the unquestionable number one under a reputation economy, speaks to the committed utopianism of the character. These post-scarcity living spaces like BNB are the primary examples of how a post-scarcity society would look like. It is possible to view them as a speculative thought exercise of Karl Marx had envisioned in Grundrisse, where automation as a result of mastery over technology and nature allows society to overcome the reliance on human labor power. Thus, labor would no longer necessarily need to serve to create wealth for others, but instead, it could be focused on the betterment of society through artistic and scientific means. The science-focused utopians of Walkaway University in the novel, for example, choose to focus on overcoming death by consciousness uploading, since they no longer need to sell their labor to others in order to simply survive. And interestingly, this is the point where the ex existence of Walkaway 
is suddenly seen as an imminent threat that needs to be completely exterminated by the Zotas, since the possibility to bring consciousness uploading to the popular classes would completely destabilize default's already fragile balance. I want to wrap this talk up by revisiting my main points and argument. In this presentation, I have argued that utopia as a method and critical utopia as a literary form are useful tools to evaluate the antinomy between scarcity and abundance. Cory Doctorow's Walkaway, written in the early 21st century but taking place in late 21st century, is a prime example of a critical utopian text that deals specifically with this relationship. In the setting of Walkaway, the technological advancements that helped create a dystopia for masses have also provided them with the tools to build its exact opposite. The dialectical relationship between dystopia and utopia here is very similar to the dialectical relationship between scarcity and abundance, considering that while the material conditions required to reach abundance are present, it is only through the commitment to utopian thought that the walkaways have been able to overcome scarcity. Instead of insisting on taking over the dystopian setting and reconf reconfiguring it as a utopia, Dr. O's utopians set out to establish a dynamic network of commu communities, renegotiating what it means to be a utopian and how to make such a project sustainable. By walking us through the conflicts between utopia and dystopia, as well as how to create a non-hierarchical society that would thrive in the abundance that the gift economy would offer, Dr. O shows us that transcending scarcity and achieving abundance can only happen through a definitive desire to enact fundamental change. When the desire for change is absent, the material conditions that would allow the decline and eventual disappearance of scarcity could also be used to enforce it on, on society and ensure its survival just like in default. And in conclusion, I argue that a stubborn insistence on alternatives and the drive to make those alternatives happen while keeping in mind that there are alternatives and not just an alternative is the key piece to a critical evaluation of the relationship between scarcity and abundance. Thank you very much for your listening.